Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first-time filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast, and with us is our first-time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hello, Josh. How are you today? I'm great, Christian. How are you? Good. It's sort of an empty house today. I was about to say, uh, you know, the guy that we can't do this without is not here, so hopefully people are listening to this, because how can we do this (laughs) podcast without Jason Rugg? I don't know. We're trying to do Zencaster. So hopefully (laughs) um, we'll be able to make this work ourselves. We shall see. Jason, we miss you. We can't wait till you come back. He's not listening. I don't know if anyone's listening right now. We're just talking to ourselves. (laughs) If you're listening to the podcast, please let us know. Somehow you could, uh, you know, let us know by sending an email to Christian at NormandyStories.com. I would love to hear from you. So just drop me a note or you can uh, tweet me at at Christian's voice on Twitter, because I'm often on Twitter. And they can review the podcast on iTunes, right? They can review the podcast on anywhere they listen to their podcast. So that would be helpful as well. Well, this is something I had heard on another podcast that if you like the podcast, not only review it, but please give it five stars because it's that whole three and a half, three, four and a half stuff. Skip it. Just go straight to five if you're going to take the time. That's how people learn about the podcast. So we thank you for the five-star review in advance. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Josh. Great advice. All right, Christian. uh, So tell us what's happening with The Girl Who Wore Freedom. It's it's on iTunes. You can rent or buy it. Yeah. Uh, Distributors are trying to distribute it. It's going on Delta at the end of the summer. Um, L'Oreal wants to come up with a makeup line called The Girl Who Wore Freedom. (laughs) That would be kind of cool, but uh, I don't think that's happening. Uh, okay. What, what, what's happening? Yeah. So it's been four weeks, actually, um, since our release of the film on iTunes in the USA. Um, and again, to recap, it's been released um, on uh, iTunes in Canada, as well as the Cineplex store, and it can be watched on Shaw Cable Company. Right now, those are the only places that our film can be seen. Um, we are curating a DVD presale list. So if you want to be added to that D- DVD presale list, please email us at Christian at NormandyStories.com and say, please add me to the list. Let me know how many DVDs you want and what your address is. And then we'll tell you how to pay for those when those are available and we'll send them out to you. I have to say it's um, been an interesting ride. You know, I talked about this before, how we just never know where we're going to be in the iTunes rankings. And I kind of think they're rigged as it is. Um, I hadn't really, so I stopped checking. I got kind of uh, disillusioned with the whole iTunes documentary charts thing. Uh, I randomly decided to check yesterday uh, and we were at 109. So we had made it back into the top 200. And then today I decided to check again and we're at 142. So I am happy to be in the um, top top documentary chart. That is at least something. And, you know, I don't know that that really helps us at all, but it's nice to be there. So there's that. I have to admit, I'm still extremely frustrated that we are not viewable anywhere else. Um, are you very frustrating? Are you able to get numbers on how many people have rented or purchased the film? Yes, I am. And I think we, the last time I got an update for our distributor was at the two week mark. And I haven't heard anything from them since, despite sending a couple of emails trying to figure that out. So, um, Hopefully they will write us this week and let us know. I do know um, that we have only had 133 reviews on iTunes. Um, Now, if you look at the other documentaries that are on the charts around us, um, you have everything from the number one, which right today is closed for Storm, and it was released July 6th, 2021. Um, So that's just, you know, is that today? Is today July 6th? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. So this is the number one film today and um, it has 17 reviews and five stars. So on the day that we released, I think we had a hundred reviews and five stars and yet we only made it to number seven. Um, And, you know, you can look down the number five is Britney Spears fighting for freedom. She has three star ratings with two reviews and she's number five. And again, we learned last week that, um, 
one of the distributors we've been talking to explains that it really is only the sales right. in a given period of time that that cause that ranking. So, well, I, um, I'm not sure if we talked about this. We may have, but you, you know, uh, you hear about authors who will buy their books in bundle to get on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm I'm guessing the same thing happens with films like this, where part of their budget is we're going to buy a bunch of our movies when it releases. So it looks like a people, a lot of people are buying our movie. Well, I mean, perhaps that's true, but I will tell you, we did think that that was true ourselves and we weren't told by the distributor how to make that happen. So we did come up with our own thing where, you know, a bunch of us bought, you know, 30 of these films at nine ninety nine. dollars hoping that that would boost us up in the rankings. And I, I know for a fact that that did not work uh, because we did that after we were kind of dropping in the rankings, we all kind of tried to do it at once and it didn't affect our rankings in any way. Now I do know that distributors can buy ads and placements with, you know, within iTunes uh, so that you show up in different places in the new and noteworthy section, or they can drop money in different ways. Um, I think, but I don't know that they actually buy in bulk to affect sales like you can with books. But of course I'm not an expert. I'm just going on what I see and experience. You're a first time filmmaker. I don't really know anything other than how (laughs) not to make a documentary. (laughs) Oh, stop it. So speaking of distribution, do they give you updates on things that they're trying to do or feedback they've received or anything like that? Um, it has been certainly not as much as I would wish. It It is um, very, very sparse. Um, we have asked for a list of places that they pitched. And like I said before, we got a list of, you know, maybe 10 places they pitched. Um, but there are plenty of other places to pitch, like I said last time. And, you know, when I asked about those, I haven't heard anything back. Um, I haven't heard anything about where they are in the stages of different things. Um, so sometimes they're forthcoming with information. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they answer emails. Sometimes they don't. Uh, it is confusing and perplexing for sure. Um, now, I will tell you, we did approach a distributor that seems to have very connected um, contacts. And we asked, is there any way they could broker a deal for us uh, with their contacts at Netflix and Amazon, et cetera? And they said, really, the only way that it would work is if they were contracted as a sub agent, a sub distributor. And so that agreement would have to be arranged with our distributor and them. And so that sub distributor would go to their contacts. Let's say they're at Netflix. They would try to pitch. And if they made a sale that, you know, they would plus up the amount by 15%, let's say. And so if Netflix bought that, they would pay a price. That sub distributor would take their 15%, pass the rest of it on to our distributor. Now, that will only happen if our distributor is open to doing that. And we will approach them with that. Will they be open? I have no idea. It's hard for me to imagine why they wouldn't be, because it would make them money as well as us. Um, But, you know, I think David Patterson is right when he says that we are responsible for selling our movie, whether it's this way or some other way. Um, you know, I guess that's the big lesson learned here is that you cannot, I mean, unless you want to, you could just set your movie out there and move on to your next movie and not really worry about what happens to it next. But I'm do not have the luxury of that choice because I still have a bunch of my own money and I'm still in debt and I need to somehow make sure that the sale of this movie, um, ends up paying for itself at least. There are a lot of people, though, I've talked to filmmakers who were like, I I never expected to make me any money. I'm just going to release it and put it out there. And if I get money back, great. But if I don't, at least my story is out there. Right. And that is a way 
you can go for sure. Um, but it's not the way I'm going to go. So, okay. So while we're waiting on distribution, you're going to pitch this idea of a sub agent. You're, is there much more for you to do with the girl who wore freedom? There are other ways that I can make income with this film. And that's, again, I'm still trying to break even with this film. That's why I retained theatrical rights, because I think the power of this film is in showing it theatrically. So, but it's on me to make those deals. So just like I'm trying to work out this deal with um, L'Oreal and Delta and Michelin um, and Fort Bragg, this could be a good income source for me if I can close this deal. Um, each one of those would pay for a screening. Um, they would pay for our expenses. Um, and in the case of Fort Bragg, they're wanting to sell our book as well as have us make a doll that they can sell in their gift shop, all of which that could help us, um, you know, pay down our debts. And um, so I still need to line up those screening opportunities for the girl who wore freedom. And, um, I do believe this is a good thing for the film in general, because the story gets out there. People can be educated. Plus it will help us hopefully break even over the course of time. So other than try to push to find a way to sell our film to buyers, um, or push our distributor, um, that's one main focus. And then the other one is trying to find ways to monetize it myself. And we still haven't found an international distributor. So that's still on the table. Um, yeah. So there's still a lot to do for that. It's just all the business work of it, not the film work. Are you, have you interviewed potential international distributors? We have, in, we have talked with um, two um, and we're told uh, there was not enough meat on the bones because we had given away the North American rights. So most international distributors, you know, they hope, yes, they can do that, but they'd also like the North American rights as well. So, I mean, we're still trying. There are other places people like me would go to the sunny side of the dock or they would go to MIP dock or they would go to, there's just all these markets um, internationally that you can take your film and sell it. If you have a sales agent, which I do not, you could also go by yourself, but you're less likely to land a deal. Um, we did put our film into a film library at a market and we had one person watch it and didn't make us an offer. So, um, you know, it's just, it's a lot of work to continue to sell your film, no matter where you do that. So that will be something I'm constantly working on, I think for a very long time. So th this podcast is about, you know, first time filmmaker, lesson learned, you know, lessons learned. Uh, you're already moving on to your next project. So what you've referenced it, the brave Dutch. Uh, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us, you know, whatever you can tell us about it, but as of right now, what are you doing differently with the brave Dutch based on your experiences with the girl who wore freedom? Yeah. Um, if you mind, if you don't mind, before I answer that, can I talk about one other thing? Of course. <laughs> that it doesn't, it's not going to take that long, but it's, it's something I want everybody to know that we're doing. So uh, we are releasing a short um, here shortly called Grueling Glory. I may have talked about this a little bit before, um, but Grueling Glory is a short film. It's about nine minutes in length that we created. And it's basically a, a little um, side baby of The Girl Who Wore Freedom because this um, story was written by Michelle Phoenix. She is a author. She's been on the podcast before. She wrote a blog post for us that we um, put on our website. And I loved it so much. I asked if we could use it to make a short. So I took her blog post and then we used some footage um, that we used previously in the film, but also mixed it with new footage that hadn't been seen before. And we, um, we made this little short called Grueling Glory, The March on Carenton. And I decided that I'm going to enter it into film festivals. Um, and there was a big question for me of, do I enter it as a first time filmmaker or not? Um, because 
this film was sort of made at the same time the girl who wore freedom was made shot at the same time and i did talk to ron tucker who's been on our podcast before who agreed that i could submit it as a first time filmmaker um project and what i realized is when i went to submit this to some of those film festivals it was asking me for stuff I'd forgotten I needed to do, such as I needed a website, I needed social media things, um, I needed, you know, I knew I needed a log line and a synopsis and a trailer and a poster and film stills, and and I had all those, but I hadn't thought about, you know, setting it up as its own film like we did with the Girl Who Wore Freedom. So now I've got to slow down a little bit, create a little tiny website, create some social media things so that I can put it into film festivals. So uh, that's going to be happening in the next couple of weeks. And I'll be interested to see how that film does at film festivals and what that experience is like as short. How long is it? Nine minutes and 23 seconds. Nine minutes and 23 seconds. So people won't be able to watch this one until it goes to the film festival circuit and then gets released somehow. Right. Yes. Correct. Okay. Um, yeah. So we'll keep you guys posted on that and update as that goes along. Um, I guess, uh, I, I, one of the things I learned is just relearned this, um, with a short, it's the same thing as it is with a regular film film festivals, except, expect you to have all of the same stuff that you would have for a feature length film. And, you know, you need to treat that little short film the same way you would treat a feature length film. So there's that. Um, and my little team has been working on getting that ready. I'm so thankful to them for that. Um, and then along with that, we have been doing a lot of work on the brave Dutch. So I talked about, um, one of the things that I found that was so interesting, Josh was, I said this before that I expected if this film did well, I would have people that asked me to direct a film or to do this, that, or the other thing. And that did not happen. But what I have learned is it has opened doors for me that I did not anticipate. So when we um, met this other distributor, Virgil Films, and we were able to sign a deal with them so that they could uh, negotiate uh, on our behalf the funding that we would need, um, I think that's what people were talking about um, when they said, once you make your first film and it's done and it does well, there will be other things that come from that. Um, and this is going to be huge for us because one of the things that I did learn from The Girl Who Wore Freedom is I really don't need to start anything unless I have the funding locked up. And so that's what we're going to try to do. Um, right now, Virgil Films is helping us to put together a whole treatment pitch document that they will then take to all of the people that they pitch to. And the goal there would be to get the funding that we need to make this film series. However, that being said, the same rules still apply. I've still had to put a team together. I've still had to put the story together. I've had to find archival material and come up with an outline or a series Bible kind of sorts so that Virgil Films can package that up and try to get the money for it. Um, one of the things that's on my to-do list is I've got to do all the stuff that I need I know I need to do. I need to do a title search. I need to get a website. I need to um, make sure that I have signed agreements for all the interested parties. Um, and I'm in the process of doing all of those things at the moment. Do you have a checklist? I mean, is this just because it seems like it's, you're rattling off the top of your head? <laughs> yeah. I'm really old school and I have um, about nine yellow notepads oh, and, and every notepad, it's one notepad for each project. And so uh, I have a to-do list for each project and mm. it's visually the way that I keep all of my projects separate and kind of keep them moving along. My son Hunter tried to get me into Todoist because Todoist is the same thing, but it's all digital. Right, right. And I did dive in there and I was trying my best, but it just didn't work for me. I had to have the paper and I had to see things physically. So yes, I'm I, keeping I, a constant checklist. I've tried Todoist. Uh, I've tried, you name it, uh, other apps and none of them really stick. The thing that's working for me right now is uh, just using the reminder app on my phone 
and I have lists in there. But what I did was, is I have an iPhone. So iPhones now have widgets. Yeah. And, and so it's big. So as soon, the first thing I see on my phone is my to-do list. So I got to make sure I, I check it. And that's been the most helpful. However, what I do when I come to my office is I pull out a legal pad. I just transfer whatever's on my to-do list for today to the legal pad for today because I, I need to be able to see it in front of me while my phone's doing other things and I can physically cross it off. That, that makes a big difference. Yeah. And if I had a whiteboard, what I would love is I'd love to have a giant whiteboard in my office where I could keep track of those things or plan out a, you know, a map of everything I need to do. But I don't have the luxury of that right now. So yeah, physically I have to have something to plan stuff like that. And well, I do keep notes on my phone as like, as they pop into my mind in the shower, I'll go out and write them in my notes and then come back and put them on a pad. Well, I, uh, you can't see so the, the wall behind me there's one in front of me the same size and i have it's a whiteboard like it's you can buy it comes rolled up and it's sticky on the back and it's probably like 12 feet by eight feet or something and and i just put blue tape to board for, for border and it is a giant vision board timeline to do list track track my stuff because i'm the same way i gotta when I walk in my office, I got to see, oh, right. That's where it is. So yeah, I think we're visual people, right? Yeah. And when you're visual people, you got to see things. So yeah, that's awesome. I saw on the Pixar's or it's a Disney plus it's called, in, I think it's called inside Pixar. And instead of interviewing all the famous people that we're all aware of the director, the writer and actor, they're interviewing the pastry chef or the maintenance person or the building maintenance person or whoever, and they interviewed a production assistant, uh, which is what I was at VeggieTales. And it's interesting how similar our jobs are. I assume they'd be totally different, but they were, they were very similar. But one of the things they did was they tracked the production and they had a giant board and they just came up with a creative way. They Every, every department picked a song that they liked. And then the production assistant would put the notes on, it was like a, a long blank musical staff. And then if you're 25 percent of the way done in animation, then you'd have 25 percent of the notes filled out on that musical staff, so you could walk by in the hallway and see, oh, we only have this much more to go. The musical staff had nothing to do other than give a visual of like this is how far we've come. <laughs> yeah, it's a graph. Yeah, right. that's great. It's super encouraging. Right, I love that. Yeah, I mean it's. It's a project like anything else. I mean, I think that's one thing that I've discovered in making this film. Making a film is a product. It's a product just like making an iPhone. And, you know, you really have to think about it in terms of that because there are deliverables. There are needs for organization. There are workflows. I mean, it's it's all the same stuff that you would use to make a widget. Um and, you know, it's important to learn those things, I think. Uh, we, we as creatives, I think, forget the production slash business part of, of filmmaking oftentimes. So can you tell us just a little bit as we're getting near the end here, uh, what is The Brave Dutch about? What What's the yeah. – is it a person? Is it the people? It's obviously yeah. a series. That's that's new. It's not a movie. Yeah. So when we talk to Virgil Films, they are like, "Oh yes, this is absolutely a series." Um, so uh, the Brave Dutch is a story about. Um, it's really about the Dutch resistance and what they did for all of the downed airmen that were trying to liberate them. And the story came about because I lived in a little town called Laurel, Mississippi, with a family uh, called the Lau family, and I was I've been friends with this family and known about this family since I was born. Basically, our my parents were friends with the Laos. Their parents were friends with the Laos. We go a long way back. And I remember um, I was close with John Lau's children, Lucy and Tinica, his two daughters. And I remember one day when their father took his life, um, my father was there, even told one of the daughters what had happened. And I remember this traumatic event in the life of our family. And as I got older and I began to learn, I had questions, of course, of what happened and who he was. I learned that he was um, of the mighty eighth air force. He was a navigator 
and he was in World War II, and he flew bombing runs from Rackheath Air Force Base um, all the way to Berlin, dropped his bombs, and came back. And on July 29th, he substituted into another bomb group, and he was, I think, the navigator on that um, bomb run. And on the way home, they were hit, and one engine went out, and it became clear they were not going to make it all the way back to England. So they bailed out over Holland. And when John Lyle bailed out, he landed in the only group of trees, I think, in all of Holland. Um, His parachute got caught, and he ended up having to cut himself down. And of course, you don't want to stay anywhere near a parachute stuck in a tree. So he then had to get away as fast as he could and was hoping to find uh, some civilian clothes to change into, find somewhere to hide. And sure enough, over a course of some very interesting incidents and, and very scary things, uh, he was taken in by the Dutch resistance and moved into the town of Appledorn. And he lived with the Cleast family for um, almost 15 months as they tried to um, keep him alive and also get him back behind allied lines. And finally, they were successful. He got back to Paris uh, around February of 45. And when he got back, he was in you know, investigated by the secret service of the U S as well as, you know, um, you know, regular army people. And he had to tell his story over and over again. He also had to, he also decided to write an homage to these Dutch people that kept him alive and tell their heroic deeds that they did not just him, but so many other airmen. And there were many Dutch people that he knew and had met who lost their lives Um, for this cause. And I think he was very, um, you know, overwhelmed with what they would do to keep him alive. Um, And he had some incredibly harrowing harrowing stories that I know uh, haunted him until the end of his days, for sure. Um, And he just did not want them to be forgotten. He did write this uh, homage, this little book called The Brave Dutch, and his family kept it forever. Um, His grandson, Reese, wanted to make it into a movie. He was an actor in L.A. for quite a while. And in 2005, he went over to Holland to um, see where his grandfather had been and to meet the people that kept him alive. And that was all research he was doing to try to write this script and turn it into a film because of life you know, happening in Reese's life, he wasn't ever able to do that film. And I knew about his efforts and I really wanted to tell this story. Um, and I started thinking about this, um, in 2019, early 2019, um, of seeing if that family would let me tell the story and using the success of the girl who wore freedom to say, Hey, do you think I can tell the story? Would you let me do it? And eventually like, you know, Reese has said um, many times, it's hard to tell me no after I've been so persistent for such a long time. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I received the rights to tell this story. I'm working with Reese Lau and the family to be able to sort of bring this story to light with a focus on the Dutch resistance and the hope of educating people about what the Dutch did during World War II. And they have a long history of not just helping these airmen, but they were hiding the Jewish people, a lot of Jewish people early on. Uh, you may be familiar with the story of Corrie ten Boom. Um, she was a Dutch woman who hid Jewish people. Um, and there are many others like her story. They also were um, used to hiding the underwater boys. I've learned that the underwater boys um, were what they called the sons of those in Holland who were of the age, you know, 16, 17, 18, who could be shipped off to Germany to be used for forced labor, um, just like they did in France. And so parents wouldn't want them to be found. And so they began hiding them. So, so many homes um, or farms or had these cubby holes and hollowed walls and, and basements um, where people were hidden and they developed, you, you know, elaborate systems to how to get extra ration cards and how to get papers and documents and, you know, to move people around. Um, it, it really is very much like the Underground Railroad 
um, you know, as I've learned about it so far, very similar, but very hard to track because it was so secretive. So do you have a, uh, so you know, you want it to be a series, you have someone that's going to pitch it. Uh, how long does it take to make this? The timeline right now is, you know, really up in the air because many things are going to determine what it ends up being. So I think I could easily make a 10 to, you know, we could even make this a, um, you know, several series thing. I've thought about this in many different ways. It could be 10 episodes the first season, you know, 10 episodes the next. There are so many stories that we have discovered and stumbled upon so far. Um, we have far more material than we could ever possibly use. And we haven't even started filming. That's just stuff that's in the records of John Lau's stories um, as we track down all these little, um, you know, side storylines. So, however, the budget that we can get from whomever will determine what we can tell. And so um, right now we are... Um, I'm working with Zach Callahan, who's been helping out um, some on the Girl Who Wore Freedom. He has been a volunteer and he really wanted to focus on screenwriting. And so we brought him early on to help with some some stuff. But also I, I was thinking about it in terms of the Brave Dutch. He's a young screenwriter, graduated from film school. And I knew that this would be great experience for him to actually get to work on something like this. So I've tasked him with you know, making an outline. And as I tell him what I envision or want, he'll sort of write it down and put it into an organized thing. So we've been working on the first and second episodes, really the second episode to figure out how we would lead into the second episode. But we are really just trying to flesh out this first episode in hopes of trying to come up with a budget. That's the first thing that we have to do, because that will determine how much we need to ask for uh, when we're asking for money to make this series. So I have brought on a wonderful new line producer. Her name is Kate Hurley. Uh, she is with Milepost 355 in North Carolina, or Asheville, North Carolina. And through her, I met Tim Bieber and Kate Zimmer. She's worked with them a long time, a wonderful DP. And uh, she is an, an executive producer, producer person. Uh, I actually went to uh, meet with them and sort of interview them for this position back in May. Uh, they are phenomenal people. And so this is a great little core group that we started with. Bill Ebel will be the editor again. Jeff Kurtnacker will be the composer. Uh, we will have a lot of the same team members that were on uh, the Girl Who Wore Freedom. We're going to roll them into this project. Michelle Coupe, our co-producer in France, um, is also going to be helpful to us because she's over there in Europe and can help facilitate a lot of things. And Helen Patton is one of our executive producers now. So putting that team together, I've been doing um, a lot of work with that. We've made relationships with people in the Dutch army, um, as well as historians and authors who've been helping us, you know, kind of come up with the story. Uh, but again, this is all unpaid work. Sweat equity starts just like any other project. Um, but I will not go, you know, deeper than this original work we're doing until we have money. However, there is always a however. Um in my mind, I would love to start shooting this next spring, but a lot of things would have to happen for that to happen. One of the things that I know already is I need to do a pre-production tour, uh, you know, scout tour to see uh, what people, what interviews I can set up, what partnerships I need to make um, and, you know, just see visually and physically what I have at my disposal in order to pull this off. Now, Will I have money from whoever's going to give us money before that? I will not. And I know I will not. So I will have to, once again, invest a little bit of personal money uh, to get myself over there to do this pre-production scout, um, you know, cost of doing business. And I will try to keep that as super cheap as I could. That also sounds like a lot of fun. So I am happens. looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, I am looking forward to it. I'm not going to lie about that. I I always think again. I I got Pixar in the brain, um, but uh, when they do a lot of scouting, 
where they, if they're going to do a movie about, you know, fish in the ocean, they'll, they'll do uh, a lot of scuba diving. If they're going to do a movie about French cooking, they'll go to France and go into French restaurants. Uh, in Toy Story 3, there's a big scene in a garbage dump. And those guys all spend a lot of time in the garbage, which th- they kind of laugh like that's all our other co-directors got to go to these, you know, exotic places. We got to go look at garbage. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think if you're going to make a movie, you should make it, you know, in places where you want to go, because if it doesn't work out, at least you, you know, got to go there. Yes. Right? So. I mean, and fortunately, you know, my stories that I've wanted to tell are in wonderful places. I mean, I have, I want to go to England to see Rack Heath Air Force Base, which is where John Lau was stationed and where he would fly out of. I've always wanted to go to England my whole life. Uh, this could be the opportunity that propels me there. Uh, I know I will get to go to Normandy because Michelle Coupe is there and I will see her and we will drive together to um to the Netherlands. Um, I've always wanted to go to the Netherlands and I'm trying to schedule it around the market garden ceremonies, which are September 16, 17, 18. That's when the 101st airborne jumped into, um, you know, Ein, um, Einhoven. And it was a colossal failure as many people know. Uh, and they do, you know, there's not these big celebrations and victory parties, but they do have commemorations for the lives that were lost there. So I'd love to go see that and um, experience that. And then I would like to learn more about this John Law story. So it, it, you know, I can sort of see if this, if nothing ever comes from this, I will have had an experience of something that I've always wanted to do. So that's how I, I think mentally justify that. And it, truthfully, um, I have somebody that's uh, going to give me a buddy pass on an airline. So that's going to be uh, a lot cheaper than normal. <laughs> I will be staying with friends and, you know, hopefully paying for gas as they drive me around and, you know, keep it really on the on the cheap side of things, but it will be a sunk cost of getting this project started because I can't even figure out how much it will cost until I understand the costs over there of things I'm going to have to pay for. So, um, yeah, it's just all part of doing business. Well, I I think the lesson here is, is, you know, you, you've done it once, you can do it again, but who, who knows what will happen with this particular series. Uh, all you can do is, is just put one foot in front of the other and, and move forward. So uh, as you have learned and the girl who wore freedom, for sure. Yeah. My plan B, if nothing happens and we don't get money up front from one of the services or streaming services to do this, my plan B is to do the same thing I did before with the girl who wore freedom, which is basically cobble it together Um, but I still will make sure that I have the budgets clear about what I need and I will have, um, the money up front before I start. All right. Lessons learned. Very cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, all right. Before we say goodbye, is there anything else we need to remind our listeners, Christian? Well, I do want to talk a little bit about Patreon. Um, we haven't been pushing that a lot on social media and we still are at the 309 subscribers there. Um, maybe actually there's 10, $309 of committed, um, monthly income and we are, um, at 10 subscribers. So I just want to say, if you have it in your heart and you have, you know, a few dollars per month to spare, we would appreciate your support. Um, it does help this podcast keep going and we will, we appreciate that. So we'd love to have, um, you know, the people that are supporters on Patreon are going to get a lot of inside information as well. Um, and be part of our bottom up team for the brave Dutch. So it'd be great for to have you along for our journey. We're also going to give that opportunity to the people on the girl who wore freedom. Not long from now, I'm going to send an email out to everybody on our mailing list uh, to, to just offer them this opportunity to be on the ground floor of the brave Dutch, um, you know, and, and see if anyone is interested to go on another journey with me. So there's that. <laughs> Well, and you can buy the film on iTunes, Apple TV, or write in to get on our DVD presale list. Yeah, no, I really encourage you. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming everyone who's listening has seen the film already, but if you haven't, please uh, rent it. Buy share it, it with somebody. Yeah, share it. Absolutely. You can gift it to people. Um, but anyhow, well, hey, uh, as it turns out, Christian, we can do this without Jason Rugg. 
So congratulations. Hopefully. We did Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. I mean, we can't say that until we actually close out and have a file that works. So <laughs> you maybe it just jinxed us. Jinxed us. All right. Well, on that note, to uh, if I'm talking to myself or if I'm talking to anyone who's listening, I want to say thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody. <laughs>